Amen. I want to give you a verse tonight, and uh, we're going to do a Bible study about prayer. The book of Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, our subject will deal with prayer tonight. And um, how many believe you can get to heaven to respond to your prayer? Oh, amen. Hey, we're not, we don't, we're not serving Buddha. You're not serving Buddha. That's right. We're not, we're not tree huggers. We're not going out in the woods and hugging trees. And that's right. Uh, we, we're not serving a God that's buried somewhere. I mean, no, you go to the tomb of Jesus, you won't find him. Oh, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Amen. The book of Acts uh, chapter 4. The book of Acts chapter 4, verse 24 says, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Again, you find this, Acts chapter 2, they all prayed with one accord in one place. But in Acts 4, they lifted their, their voice to God with one accord. What does that mean? They were focused. Everybody was on the same path. Everybody was focused on the same thing. And it said, it said Lord, thou art God. I want somebody to shout, Lord, Lord. You, are God, you are God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. They are praying. There is, there is uh, opposition against the church. A, a crippled man had been healed. There is opposition. They're trying to stop that. You know what the church did? We're going to go to prayer. God, give us boldness that we may speak thy word in boldness and that in the name of Jesus, signs and wonders would take place among us. Do you believe signs and wonders, healings and miracles, the power of God can move among us? Amen. I was healed on a Wednesday night Bible study and I come to tell you, he can still heal us tonight on a Wednesday night Bible study. And when they had prayed, I want everybody to shout, and when they had prayed, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. Amazing is that when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Amen, amen. I'd like to preach to you just simply about prayer tonight and when they had prayed. Clap your hands to the Lord and magnify him. God bless you as you are seated. First, let's just establish tonight that when you pray, heaven responds. When you pray, heaven responds. I know there's a, a lesser crowd tonight, but we're not limited to the power of God by a lesser crowd. We probably have 100 plus at youth camp tonight that's traveled up by bus or car pulling up there to be with our young people, and, and we're fine, perfectly fine with that. Let me say tonight that we have been praying and seeking God for what he's going to do this coming Sunday evening with Pastor Jack Cunningham. If you've ever been excited, it's time to be excited. Something powerful is going to happen among us on Sunday. Do you believe that? We've been praying. We've been fasting. We believe. I want each of you tonight in this altar to begin to have some names that come to you. And I want you to begin to pray for those people. And I want you to contact those people after prayer and ask them to come to church with you. And I believe they're going to come to church with you on Sunday night at 6 p.m. When you begin to study altars, 
There seems to be that Cain and Abel offered to God uh, a sacrifice. I preached a little bit about it Sunday. I won't allude to it uh, in too much detail. I'll, I'll just make reference to it. But God accepted Abel's and God rejected Cain's. There must have been something that happened that showed that God had accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he did not receive Cain's. There was a response from God on their altar of sacrifice. When you go into the word of the Lord, you will find that there was a time in David's life that he had numbered the people. And when he numbered the people, the Bible said that Satan has, had provoked him to sin and number the people. It wasn't that he was just trying to see the census of how many people were in the army. He was numbering the army to see if he had enough people to win the battle. I mean, that was unbelief. Unbelief. David numbered the people, and when he numbered the people, God got angry with him. He was wroth with him. Somehow in David's leadership, he got away from the fact that you could kill giants with slingshots. And I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, which means an innumerable army. David, somewhere in his leadership, got away from the fact of what God can do and started thinking about what men can do. And when David numbered the people, God got very upset with him and judgment come against him and a, and a sword came down and, and uh, began to bring uh, judgment against the people. And there was an actual angel with the sword that had come down and brought judgment against the people. And, and uh, David decided to build an altar. Everybody shout, an altar. He built an altar before the Lord and the man's name was Ornan. He owned the property or the threshing floor. And he told David, he said, let me give it to you. David said, can I buy this place he said, no. He said, let me give it to you. I will give it to you. I'll give you the wood for the altar. I'll give you the sacrifice to put on the altar. I'll give it all to you. And David said, no, you don't understand. How can I offer something to God that costs me nothing? Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to cost you. That's right. He said, David looked at him. He said, I will buy, you, buy it from you for the full price. That means I don't want I don't want a special on the property. You sell me this property for what its value is because we just can't uh, cheap our way to the blessing of God. Amen. You just can't get by or do it your way. It's like Brother Nehemiah preached here one time about offering God molded bread and blinded sheep. It's going to cost you something to have a move of God. It really is. We've got to give God our best. Do you believe that? We've got to give God of our time. That's right. Amen. Don't think for a minute you're going to have revival and no prayer put into it. No extra time put into it. I said it last Sunday that people that are, people that are content or satisfied, they don't have any need to pray. They don't have any need to fast. People that are satisfied with how many people are saved. But you give me somebody that's not satisfied. They've been moved because their family's lost. They've got kids that are not in church. They've got a, a spouse that needs the Lord. They've got a, 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 a grandparent that, that needs a miracle. You know what'll happen? They'll say, I need to get a hold of God. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna build an altar and I'm gonna spend some time with that altar. Amen. If you're going to see prayers answered, you've got to ask some prayers. You've got to take some time for prayer. And, I, and tonight I really do feel this, that I'm among some people that says I'm not content. I'm not satisfied. There's some fatherless children that need saved. There's a city that needs converted. We need an outpouring of his spirit to see lives change. And we're not going to sit back and do nothing. We're going to get a hold of God. Praise God. And so that's, that's sort of what David was saying. We need God. We, I, I see judgment coming to the land. We need God. And he, and he builds this altar. He buys the threshing floor from Ornan. And uh, uh, he buys the threshing floor. He, he invests in this altar, puts a sacrifice there, and he prays. And a fire came out from before the Lord. And answer, come up on that altar. And God stopped the judgment. The Bible says that the judgment stayed, it stopped, and God visited his altar. You can look at Abraham when he built altars that God would answer his prayer, and God would come to the altar in which he would build. Let me preach to you tonight this, 
This place where David paid the full price, he paid a price. I'm not talking about man be paying, be just go through the motions type of stuff. I'm talking about a sacrifice. And you know the sacrifice in your life. Getting up and praying extra. Getting a hold of God. Man, I feel something coming on me right now. You can't, you can't pour something into God and get nothing out of it. Because the Bible says with God, nothing is impossible. If you're praying and you're fasting, you can mark it down. God's getting ready to do something. Do you believe that? I feel a heaven response coming to the sacrifice of this church. The threshing, I want everybody to say the threshing floor of Ornan. Everybody say this. It's where David paid the full price. That's right. When Solomon went to build the temple, which became a wonder of the world, in 2 Chronicles you'll find that Solomon, Solomon built this temple. And the temple was magnificent. I mean, it really was. It was a, a beautiful place. It represented the glory of God, and it represented the kingdom of God on the earth. When he built the temple, guess where Solomon chose to build the temple? It was at the place that David purchased from the threshing floor of Ornan. Where David paid the full price became the location for the glory of God. Some people can pay a price, but they can't pay the full price. They can give God a convenience, but they can't pray till they break through. There's got to be a moment that you draw the circle in the sand. Say, I'm not getting out of this prayer meeting until I get a hold of God. Come on, come on, Wendy's Taco Bell prayer meetings. It didn't work. How many know what I'm talking about? You pull up to the drive through you make your order, you pull up to the first or second window, depending on how busy they are, and you hand them your money and get to the next window, and they're supposed to have your bag waiting on you, your food, you know. It's not done within three minutes, you're ready to leave. And we pull up sometimes to the altar of God. We say, this is what I'd like you to do. And if it doesn't happen in five minutes, we stop praying. It doesn't work that way. James Kilgore, many years ago, pastored in Houston. And he, uh, he has something to happen one time in his ministry. He was tired of going to church and nobody being saved. He was tired of going to church and no one being baptized, no one, no one, being, no one repenting, no one getting the Holy Ghost. It stirred him. It stirred him. He said, something's got to change. Can I ask the anchor tonight, would you be satisfied if we didn't baptize anybody else till Jesus came? Would it be okay with you that if we would turn the baptism, that it would never end up out here, but we just turn it into a storage room and, you know, would you be okay if there was no move of God and no sinners ever repented? I'll tell you what you all do. I know you. You'd be calling your own prayer meetings. You say, Pastor, I think we need to pray. I haven't seen anybody repent in a long time. We haven't seen any healings or miracles in a while. Something's wrong. We need to get a hold of God. I know the anchor enough. In the history of this church about prayer, this church wasn't founded with some program. This church was founded in 1942 in a prayer meeting. That's who we are. Come on, the anchor, the roots of who we are is we are a people of prayer, that the church is a house of prayer. He was so stirred. You know what he did? He went to the church. He, he climbed up into the attic of the church, removed the ceiling tile, got up in the, in the attic area and put the ceiling tile back and went to prayer. Oh, Brother Powell, he sought God, hour number one and hour number two, and somebody came to the church, Pastor, Pastor, he just went quiet. He didn't answer the people that was calling for him. Finally heard the door shut and he went back to prayer. He prayed hour three, hour four. Somebody else came, pastor, pastor. He didn't answer because he's trying to get a hold of God. They left. He prayed five and six and seven. After eight hours of praying in one spot, he said something broke. Something changed. He had given it all he had. He had paid the full price, if you will. And when he got a hold of God, he, he knew he had touched heaven. The next service, 50 people were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in that church. 50. 
Amen. God's not going to do it your way. We've got to do it his way. And he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. You know what I believe that means, humble? Is that you get the heart of God. That you humble yourself until you desire what he's desiring. And I feel like he does want to reach the backslider. He does want to see this city converted. He does want to see people come back to him. He does want to fill them with his spirit. He just wants us to humble ourselves till we want what he wants. Somebody shout amen. amen. I heard that message years ago. I was just a young teenager. I was a young minister in the church and I got so hungry I got out of the bed. I used to listen to preaching every night when I'd go to bed. And uh, many nights it, it, I get so stirred. Oh, Brother Ronnie Evans, I get so stirred with hearing preaching. We live beside the church, you know, which is pretty convenient. I get out of my bed, put my clothes back on. Get out of my PJs, put my clothes back on. I go over to the prayer room in the, in the Glen Ferris Apostolic Church, go down there and I'd start praying. I'd rock back and forth. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. There's, there's people here that's never prayed, that's come to church for some time. I'll never forget, I got in the spirit of intercession for two people. I started calling their names out to the Lord. Two people that has never even made a move in the church. Two young people never went to the altar before. I started calling their names out in that prayer. I prayed and I sought God. I started asking God to set them free. Lord, let them be filled with the Holy Ghost. I prayed until I touched heaven. How many know what I'm talking about? In reality, I think heaven was touching me. Come on, we're trying to touch heaven. But what I'm preaching about is when the people prayed, heaven responded. Sometimes you gotta just lock yourself in a prayer room, in a prayer closet, in an altar somewhere and say, I'm praying till heaven shows up. I'm not leaving the altar till heaven comes. Come on, do you believe in that? Oh, something happened. Brother Sean Turner, something happened when I was praying. Heaven came down. I went to the church the next day during praise and worship. The two young ladies I was praying for the night before during praise and worship stood up, threw their hands in the air, and God filled them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know why? Because when you pray, I believe we have enough power. He told Simon Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And I feel a witness coming up on me right now. He said the gates of hell shall not prevail. I don't care how long the devil's had him in his hands. You can pray him out of the chains and bondage of the devil. Amen. He gives you the key to set them free. Amen. I want you to shout with me. You can pray him out. I believe you can pray them out of drug addiction. You can pray them out of deception. I believe you can pray them out of false doctrine. I believe there's power when the church begins to pray. That's right. I began to bind the enemy one time. I, 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 I went to St. Louis, heard a preacher preach about binding and loosing. About, and let's just turn to it. Matthew, Matthew chapter 16. Let's look what it says, verse 18. Turn your Bibles there. Matthew 16 and 18. Everybody shout when you pray. Do y'all feel what I feel? Amen. Look what it says. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, revelation of who God is, I will build my church. Everybody shout, we are the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail or stop it. I don't want to be a defensive church. I want to be a, an, an offensive church. We're going somewhere. We're expanding boundaries and borders. We're getting back what belongs in the kingdom. Any warriors in the building? Come on, how many warriors in the building? There's some people that aren't here that need to be here that can't come back here because hell can't keep them. Not when I'm praying. Look what it says. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be what? Bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be. Let me just tell you what that means. It means heaven's gonna back you up. When you begin to bind the enemy, I heard a man say, you ought to bind fear. You ought to bind deception. You ought to bind 
bondage. You ought to bind anything that could hold somebody. Offense or whatever it might be. Bind it and I bind each of those in the name of Jesus. Many of you have heard me teach this. When you're done binding what the devil's done and you're binding the spirit of what is in their life, you start loosing. Now that I've bound the enemy in their life, I'm going to start loosening things to them. I loose unto them joy. I loose unto them faith. I loose unto them a spirit of prayer. I loose unto them a desire to be in the house of God. When you do that, then I end it, then I plead the blood over them. There was a man one time that was coming to church. He didn't believe the oneness message. My dad would preach every now and then. He'd get up. He didn't agree with the doctrine. He'd get out and walk out. He'd go. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start binding the spirit of deception in his life, spirit of false doctrine in his life, and I'm going to start loosening some things spiritual to him. I'm just young. I'm just a teenager. I said, but I believe this. I think I was 19 maybe and uh, maybe 20. But I took that man into my altar time. And I pray, would pray till I touched heaven. Everybody say heaven. I think I said it a while ago. I pray till heaven would touch me. And I began to say, I bind in the name of Jesus every spirit of confusion in his mind. I bind the spirit of bondage, the thing which keeping him from coming to the altar and repenting. I bind the spirit of fear. It's the spirit of tradition, only doing things because that's the way his family did. I bind that in his life. I loosen to him revelation in Jesus' name. I loosen to him faith in Jesus' name. Do you know that I did that, Brother Terry, and the next Sunday that man ran to the altar and repented was baptized in Jesus' name? Because when you pray, I'm not talking about religiosity, mark the check the box that you pray today. I'm talking about getting a hold of God. If it takes me five minutes or 25 or five hours, I'm going to get a hold of God. And I got a hold of the Lord. You know what? It wasn't long after that. That man died and went to be with the Lord. Thank God somebody prayed him out before it was too late. I really feel that this coming Sunday night, there are some people in here that you're believing that that which you've been praying for is going to come to fruition. If you believe God's going to answer some prayers this weekend, jump up, clap your hands, and shout hallelujah. Come on, we are believers. We're believing for our families. We're believing for our city. We really are. Something amazing is going to happen. Something amazing is going to happen. Amen, amen, amen. I think it's interesting, Brother Mealy. I believe it was two years ago, two and a half years ago maybe, that we were having a structure meeting. We were having an end of the year annual planning session. And I began to go month to month. When we got to June, I started talking about Brother Cunningham. Do you remember that? And the Holy Ghost fell on me. God moved in there talking about Brother Cunningham when we got to the month of June. I don't know remember why June, except it was in the month of June in that annual planning session that we didn't even finish the end of it. Here we are now, two years later, and he's coming in the month of June. I believe that God's hand is on this service so strong. Amen. You see, God gives gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I really do believe that this meeting is ordained of God. That something miraculous is going to happen. Whatever you're doing, make sure you're here. Don't skip by any means. You need to come and say, I'm a part of the church. I want God to do something, and I'm going to bring somebody with me so they can receive as well. Would you receive that and thank God for what he's going to do on Sunday night again? <laughs> David's altar became Solomon's temple. David's altar became Solomon's temple. If you'd understand and study this, you'll also find it's the same place where Abraham offered Isaac. He withheld nothing from God. It was a place where God visited Abraham and the angel said, because the Lord has seen that you've held nothing from him. He's going to give, he, he is going to bless those that bless you. There's a, there's a, a nation coming out of you because you have paid the price. What am I saying is that when people obey God and build altars to the Lord, heaven always, somebody shout, always responds. If you would turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles tonight. I get fired up talking about this because I'm telling you, prayer works. How I many know God can set people free from emotional bondage? Amen. There's an attack on our emotions. 
you know, people battling suicide or depression or any, any emotional thing, I want you to have them here. Many of them will be set free in the atmosphere. Spirit of the Lord is going to move in waves in the service and people is just going to be healed. There was some scripture where he healed some of them. Then there were some of the times he healed. Somebody shout, all. Oh. I believe that's going to be Sunday night. Everybody that needs a healing is going to get healed. I just believe that. Can there be a hearty amen? When you look when Solomon built the temple, Solomon built the temple that he prayed a prayer. He sacrificed he sacrificed tens of thousands of animals laid on the altar one after another given, given to the Lord at the altar of sacrifice. And uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 11, I mean chapter 6, verse 21 says, Hearken therefore unto the supplication of thy servant. Let's look at it. Let's read it together in this Bible study. Hearken therefore unto the supplications of thy servant, and of thy people Israel, which they shall make toward. Everybody shout, this place. What place is it? It's, it's, it's Jerusalem. This is Solomon's, Solomon's temple. This is the altar. It's a representation of the glory of God. Where? Where the full price was made. It's where a covenant was made with God. That's the key word tonight. A covenant. It's where a covenant was made with God. A place of true repentance. And he said, which they shall make toward this place, hear thou from thy dwelling place, even from, shout it, and when thou hearest, that's right, if a man, somebody shout, if a man sin, he said, if a man sin against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to make him swear and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou from and do and judge thy servants by requiting the wicked, by recompensing his way upon his own head and by justifying the righteous, by giving him according to his righteousness. And if thy people, Israel, be put to the worst before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall return and confess thy name and, and make supplication before thee in this house then hear thou from the heavens and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest to them and to their fathers when the heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee Yet if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them, then what? Hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain upon thy land which thou hast given unto thy people for an inheritance. Let's stop here for a moment. I don't want to bore you in the reading. I think you're following along well. But let me just say it this way. He said if they sin and your judgment comes against them, if they will pray toward this place, if they get to a place they say, I don't want to be judged. I've sinned. I've failed. Oh God, the heavens is shut up. It's not even raining because of my sin. If they pray toward the place and repent, oh God, hear them from heaven and forgive their sin and what? Really heal their land. He goes in verse 28, if there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting or mildew or locust or caterpillars, all that stuff that is judgment or sickness or whatever, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness be there. Why? Because they walked away from God. Sometimes judgment comes in that form to get people's attention. How many know that's right? Amen. I watched Sister Stahl come back to the Lord when sickness come in her body. How many remember that? Sister Stahl come back to the Lord. She was away from the Lord for nine years, former Sunday school teacher. She come back to the Lord after sickness come to her body, and she said, I just want to be right with God. That's mercy. Come on, it sounds cruel, but isn't that mercy? Amen. I'd rather God bring sickness to my body and get my attention and bring me back home than to die and be lost in a healthy body. 
How many believe that? How many want to be saved for eternity? That's right. He says this way. And so Solomon, this is Solomon's prayer. The building's dedicated. The sacrifices have been laid down, and he's praying a prayer. God, if your people that have strayed away come back and repent, Lord, and they pray. He went as far to say if they're away, and they would just face. Do you all see the power of this? If they're far off and they've got sin, or they're in battle, or they've been besieged by the enemy, or if they've been imprisoned by the enemy, whatever, and they, God, turn toward this place, which is what? An altar. I could take you to the spot where my altar began. It was a place where I laid there until everything in me that wasn't right with God died, and everything in me that needed to be like, like him began to come alive. I can tell you this spot. I prayed till something changed within me. That's the truth. It was an altar in my world. And he said, if they will look back to this place and begin to pray, what will I do? He said, God, I'm asking you to forgive them, to give them power over their enemies. Man, I feel something in this room. I believe that as a person can be in the bondage of drug addiction that have walked away from God, but they come to their attention and realize, I don't want to be an addict any longer. I don't want to be in bondage any longer to these things. That they can turn back toward that altar where they made a covenant with God and say, God, I'm asking you to forgive me. And the Lord will give them power over that addiction. God will give them power over the hold of the enemy. Come on, if you believe it, shout amen. Anchor church tonight, I just want to know, do we have a Solomon's temple with that type of altar that's in this church? Or is this just some religious church where we just go through the motions? Or do we have an altar that backsliders can look back to and say, I believe I could go home. There's something there that's powerful. I've got something at the church. Come on. I believe people could be in a bar stool setting and come to their attention and say, I shouldn't be here. This isn't what God called me to do. I'm going home. And God wouldn't give them mercy at that moment. He said, Lord, even if they're not back yet, but they get stirred to a point they want to change. If they will pray toward this place, it's possible while I'm preaching tonight that there's some people watching online tonight that saying, you know what? I really wish I could get right with God and you're hungry for it. Can I tell you, you can get right with God. You don't have to be at 1365 Chamberlain Street. Just start praying on your couch. Just start praying from your bedroom and the Lord will begin to minister to you. You don't belong in the world. You don't belong disconnected from God's people. He's calling you. You can come home. There's healing for you your family. There's healing for your situation. Oh, if you believe it, jump to your feet, clap your hands and shout hallelujah. There's healing. There's healing. There's healing. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Nehemiah, I'm convinced when the church starts praying, God starts moving. He does. When the church starts praying, God starts moving. You can be seated. There's a verse in the scripture there's a verse in the scripture, a little bit off from where I was planning on going. But there's a verse that says that God will devise means that his banished be not expelled. That was spoken by the woman of Tekoa who played the role uh, of a lady trying to get hired by, by Joab to get Absalom to come home. Absalom had been moved to another country because he killed his brother. And Joab was trying to get David to bring his son home. And so she acted out this scene as if her two brothers were fighting, I mean, her two sons were fighting, one was dead. And that this community, the, the village was going to kill her other son because he killed his brother. And David said, he deserves mercy. And she said, king, does not even God devise means that his banished be not expelled? What she was saying is, God in his nature, before he will expel someone for eternal damnation, he will devise means to get that person that's been banished back into the fold. What does that mean? That God will begin to orchestrate a plan to reach those that are away from the flock to gather them back into the fold where they belong. God's plan is that his banished will not be expelled. See, there's a difference between getting suspended from school and expelled from school. 
If you're suspended, you're gone for a period of time. If you're expelled, you can't come back. God will devise means that those that are banished. That's where this altar call is going tonight. Amen. This altar call is going to be praying for some of the banished. That really deep down, they want to be at church. They just don't feel like they can. It's sort of the story of the prodigal. He's out there slopping hogs and he's dirty and his feet are sore and his hands are gritty. And here he is. He came to himself. He was banished but not expelled. And I come to tell you right now, some of your children might be banished, but they're not expelled. And God's waiting on the church to pray for the banished to come home. Do you believe the banished can come home? And so that's the prayer of Solomon. Solomon said, if your people sin and the Lord's sickness comes to them, pestilence, caterpillars, blasting or mildew or locusts, whatever judgment comes, Verse 29 of 2 Chronicles 6, look what it says. It says, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in his house. Wouldn't it be awesome somebody that has cancer that's away from God could feel, you know, I think I could go home. Come on, don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying everybody gets sick, has sin. Y'all know how I preach. But I'm saying if it would take that if somebody's away from God to get them where they need to be, amen. And that's what he said. I'll, I'll remove all your materialism, all your material value. I'll, I'll send the locusts and the caterpillar. I'll eat up your fields. I'll stop the rain from coming. Give a drought to everything you're depending on. You know why he stopped the rain in Elijah's day at Mount Carmel for three and a half years? Because Baal meant the God of the rain. He said, I'll prove to you that Baal's not God. It doesn't matter how many altars they built to Baal, they couldn't get a drop of rain out of the sky until the prophet came and said, Jehovah is the Lord God. Amen. And when they built an altar to Jehovah, how many know the fire fell upon it? And a whole nation repented and said, the Lord, he is the God. What I'm saying is that when the people begin to pray, heaven will respond. He said it this way. And if they will pray in this house, verse 30, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render unto every man according to all his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. When you go to chapter 7, verse 1, let's turn there. Chapter 7, verse 1. Amen. When thou prayest. Everybody shout, when you pray. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, you can read the rest of the chapter. It's, it, I've pretty much covered in principle the rest of it. Sake of time, we'll skip some. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying. Everybody say praying. The fire came down from heaven. When he prayed what he wanted for the people of God. This house isn't just to be a, a spectacle of beauty. This is to be a house of prayer. The church isn't just to be a place of gathering of Christian community is to be a house of prayer. The church isn't a place just where we come and go because that's where we're members and we tithe. No, it's to be a house of prayer. What is it for? Backsliders to come home. What's it for? Saints to get that reward of their righteousness. Come on, how many know there's a reward of righteousness and it's peace? Somebody shout peace. The Bible says that peace... The, the, the peace, uh, for the, he is the prince of peace and God gives us peace in our righteousness. And you, when you begin to look at that, that's what's amazing how many people come to church and they say, Pastor, when I come to church, I feel like I get peace for the rest of the week. My week goes so much better when I come to the house of God. Aren't you glad you have a house to come to where you can feel the glory of God and the peace of the Lord? I really don't feel like anybody here says, well, I'm here out of obligation. I'm preaching to a Wednesday night crowd tonight. You're, you're that group that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. When you've paid the price, 
You've built the altar. You've laid the sacrifice. Mark it down. Heaven will respond. But I'm just waiting on God. You need to quit waiting and start sacrificing. You want to pray for three minutes. You've been on social media for three hours and want God to save your family. Watch TV for five hours and pray for your kids for five minutes. I think I'm making a pretty clear point. Watch all the news about every bad event, and politics and everything going on. Get all emotionally worked up and not even take time to read three chapters in the Bible and get stirred about lost souls. What I'm saying is if you want to see something happen in your family, You've got to build an altar that God can respond to. And it's guaranteed if you'll build an altar, put on the sacrifice, God's going to answer that prayer. I said it's guaranteed. 100% guaranteed. You believe that? That's, that's, how many believe that? Build an altar. Add on to your schedule. I'm going to get up earlier. You know, I just want to, I, I, I want to do something different. Get out of the routine. I don't want to be a routine prayer. I want to be the effectual, everybody shout, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When's the last time you wept over a sinner? When's the last time you wept over a lost family member? You have to think about it. If you can't weep over the lost, you need to turn off all media. All media. Limit your diet to only necessary type of food. And get a hold of God. Abstain from all pleasure. So I'm going to get away from me so I can get a hold of him. That's the whole purpose of fasting. It's not, listen, fasting is not to make God feel sorry for you. Well, you know, if I don't eat for a while, God will see me down there suffering because I haven't had chocolate in a week. The Lord's going to feel sorry for me because I gave up media for five days. Oh, my goodness. People think they move heaven if they give up media for five days. Y'all a tough crowd right now. I was talking about prophecy earlier, and y'all were happy. I'm talking about sacrifice. You're like, it's almost 8 o'clock, Pastor. School crowd's about to disappear, and it's not even school. school school's not even in session. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But my point is, how bad do you want them saved? There's got to get an emotional aspect. I could take you to the spot in Cambridge where the church shifted. I could take you to the moment when I was pastoring and I was talking about prayer. I was talking about and the spirit of prayer came over me, Brother Nehemiah. I walked off the platform. I said, you're dismissed. Probably about 20 people there that night on a Tuesday. There was about 20 people that night. I went over in the corner and found a little place to pray in the corner. And I started rocking back and forth how I was doing praying. And in the spirit of prayer, it was a perfect heavenly father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It wasn't none of that, it was prayer. It was passionate prayer. Oh, God, the city needs revival. Lord, there's broken people. Oh, there's fatherless children. There's drug addiction. Oh, God, there's a lot of sinners that need deliverance. Oh, God, I don't want this city to go to hell. There's backsliders that need to pray through. Oh, God, we want to have revival like we've never had before. I pray you would stir the, stir the heart of men and women that they would feel the call to repentance and to turn away from their wicked, sinful ways, oh God. That there would be a desire to call to righteousness, oh God, in this city. I pray you would stir us, oh God. That, Lord, you look beyond the failures of man and give mercy to them and look beyond their faults and see their needs. Lord, let the gospel be preached. Let your voice be felt. God, let your spirit be moved. And I'll be to pray in that corner praying just like that I forgot anybody was in the building I forgot anybody was around I got lost in the spirit of prayer when I came to it might have been an hour or so later I came to I was lost in prayer I feel like I'm getting lost in it right now I feel heaven coming down to me I'm telling you there's something that happens when a person fervently gets a hold of God come on some of you need to get on your knees and rock back and forth oh God don't let my wife be lost oh God don't let my husband be lost don't let my grandbabies go to hell oh God I pray you would soften their hearted hearts I pray oh God you would move upon their spirit God I pray 
Pastor's angel right now. I pray against the spirit of cancer. I pray against the sickness of cancer. I pray against God and the thing that would affect your people. Come on, do you believe prayer works? I might look like a fool to you, but it moves heaven when you get heartfelt about what God wants to do for his people. It might seem silly, but it moves God. It moves God. Brother Nehemiah, I know how you pray. And that's how I pray. He prayed. He said, God, if there's soreness or sickness or caterpillars or mildew or enemies or war, the heavens are shut up. That's how he's praying. He's not some casual prayer. He said, God, let this place be effective. Let this place be a turning point. I'll never forget when I got finished praying, I looked in the room. There was still about 20 people that was there. Nobody left the building. I forgot anybody was in that room on a Tuesday night prayer meeting. When I come to in Cambridge in that, that church, nobody left. I was in the spirit of prayer. I was praying. I, I, I prayed myself into the spirit of prayer. I couldn't even talk in English. I talked in tongues all throughout the building. Got in my car, began to drive down somewhere halfway distance. I feel like I could have a conversation. And I called my wife. I said, Cindy, I said, it changed tonight. Something broke tonight. Something shifted tonight in Cambridge. I'm telling you, God moved tonight in Cambridge. It'll never be the same. I come back the next Sunday morning and started prophesying when I was preaching. I said, everybody look at the door. I said, they're coming. You better get ready. They're coming through that door. It wasn't long. There wasn't enough seats in the building. You couldn't get them all in the sanctuary. It wasn't because of good preaching. It was because of powerful praying that made the difference. They came from every walk of life. People that, people that have been backslid for 55 years, just like Martha Ross, were praying through the Holy Ghost. People that were bound by depression and anxiety because of brokenness in their childhood would have been set free of their leaders in that church today. You know why? Because if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked way. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Come on, I'll heal their mind. I'll heal their body. I'll heal their spirit. I just need a church that'll pray. I wish somebody that wanted to pray would run up here in this altar with me right now. Come on, if you feel like praying, run up here to this altar with me right now. We're gonna pray in a moment, but I feel a call to prayer. I feel a call to prayer. Hallelujah. Come on, run up in this altar. If you got a daddy not saved, you got a grandbaby not saved, you got children that don't know the Lord, you got some people that are wayward, get up in this altar with pastor for a moment and shout in the name of Jesus, I'm claiming deliverance. I'm claiming a breakthrough. I'm claiming a powerful move of your spirit. Lord, you can wake them up. You can stir their heart. Come on, that's it. In the name of Jesus, I'm building an altar.